May the name of God, the most compassionate and most merciful, and may Allah's peace and blessing be on Prophet Muhammad. We welcome you at King Faisal Center for research and Islamic studies. Had this uh, a speech, which is very important, which is about putting down, putting out fires, and how to end armed conflict in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. This will be presented by Martin Gibbs, the CEO of. A Proxel uh, Institute of Peace, he is the head of the European uh, Institute for Peace, and he is also a conflict resolution uh, uh, official. He has a wide experience in the humanitarian uh, affairs, in addition to being a CEO of a non governmental organization. Mr. Griffiths also has a wide knowledge and experience at the UN in the humanitarian and political uh, areas and human uh, and also peace missions uh, at the country level and at the headquarters. And he uh, has the capability also to find solutions and to building teams and also managing large organizations. Sir Martin, we welcome you here in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. Of course, the uh, subject of putting uh, out the fires, how to end the armed conflict in Iraq and Syria and Yemen is very important uh, subject and very crucial subject, especially these days. Uh, always we are talking, when we talk about the strategies, about the ends and means and tools. Uh, so uh, without further ado, we will let you speak for uh, 40 minutes. Then after that, we will be taking the comments and the question. Uh, we remind the audience to, bid the, to put their phone on silent mode. Uh, Please, Mr. Martin. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming this evening and thanking the King Faisal Center very much for the, for the invitation. This is a, a, a great privilege for me. And uh, because exactly it is such an important and um, complicated subject, I've made sure that before coming here, I've set down a few notes for my, for my presentation. Uh, so if you'll forgive me, I'll refer to them as we go along. When I was agreeing with Dr. Saud uh, a few months ago, to do this uh, presentation. Uh, I never imagined that uh, this would come at a time of such tension and interest uh, here in the issues that we're going to be looking at tonight. And as you can imagine, uh, I was perhaps not alone in this innocence of mine. My first reaction to recent events was to seek a postponement of my presentation. Uh, but I soon realized that in fact, these recent events have made us all think much more clearly and perhaps more deeply about the political and conflict dynamics in the region. So this is the time, therefore, for all of us who work for and believe in stability and progress and peace in this region to come together honestly to reflect on what now needs to be done. I have chosen, as you've mentioned, Yahya, three conflicts as the focus of my talk, Syria, Iraq, and Yemen. Others are conspicuously absent. Libya, for example, uh, the Middle East peace process, of course, and albeit in a different way, the situation in Lebanon. But I've chosen these three conflicts because my institute, the European Institute of Peace in Brussels, is working and has been working for some time in all three of these conflicts in very different ways to try to contribute to their resolution. And I hope and believe that this gives me a perspective which I hope you'll find useful this evening. I'd first, in this presentation, like to look at the current situation in each of the three conflicts, adding suggestions perhaps for ways to stabilize and resolve them in each case, perhaps ambitiously. This will give me a basis for some general conclusions, and even more presumptuously, I would like to offer some suggestions and advice at the end on what we might do, with particular reference to where we are sitting tonight in Riyadh. So firstly, looking at Syria. Uh, I have had, personally, uh, uh, a great uh, deal of exposure and personal experience in Syria's conflict in the last five years. I've been very fortunate, in a way, to, to, to have this. I'm, I think, one of only two people 
who has worked for all three United Nations envoys on Syria. Firstly, Kofi Annan in 2012, Lachda Brahimi, who replaced him, and Stefan de Mistura, who remains the envoy. And indeed, Stefan, after I left the United Nations Syria work in late 2014 to start the direction of the European Institute of Peace, de Mistura was at that time the president of our institute. So we've had a very close relationship with events in Syria. And I have watched with the same agony as I suspect we all have in this room, the relentless destruction of this country and the suffering of the Syrian people. And I want to start with a very personal experience. I was among the first to enter the village of Al-Hula, north of Homs, in central Syria, on a very bright Saturday morning in the last days of May in 2012. I had the awful privilege of seeing, wrapped in white shrouds in the mosque, the 120 bodies, all of women and children, slaughtered the night before by people who for generations had lived in a village across the valley. I had the chance from this uh, experience to know the truth about the first atrocity. I was working at the time for Kofi Annan, but I was based in Syria. I knew that it was, an, I, I realized immediately that this atrocity was an act designed to project fear, that it was an act to spoil and prevent Kofi Annan, the UN envoy for Syria, due to arrive in Damascus just exactly two days after these events. And his purpose in that visit to Damascus was to begin a political process. And this had been widely advertised with the authorities in Damascus. After the events in Al-Hula, there was no prospect for any such dialogue. And Al-Hula has become for me, personally, a constant reminder of the simple fact that brutality will be used to further war and prevent peace. So much, so much has happened since in Syria. Syria's dead, I think, now reaches approximately half a million people these five years. Up to three quarters of Syrians have fled their homes, many of them fled their country. International diplomacy has made every effort to find solutions. But of one thing I'm quite certain, it's not over yet. There's no doubt that the ambitions of the opposition have been dashed, possibly for good. This should give us pause and shift our strategies. But I remember one Syrian fighter from an armed group in the opposition recently telling me that would be entirely wrong to, as he put it, and I quote, to count the Sunnis out, unquote, as he put it. So here are my, my thoughts and my assessments on Syria's current situation. First, as already mentioned, we have not seen the end of this conflict. And we have not seen the end of the way which will define the new Syria. It's not over much as many people seem to think it might be. Second, the de-escalation zones uh, that have res resulted from international diplomacy have certainly brought in a very important temporary uh, alleviation of suffering, temporary respite in the conflict. Extremely important, not to be un understated and not to be diminished, and that's a very good thing. But nobody seriously, I think, believes that those arrangements are final, uh, they are provisional, and we need all to plan for what succeeds them and how Syria will be governed and what kind of society it will have in this region. Third point, I think Daesh has been or is about to finally be pushed out of Syria. 
Syrians, and indeed Iraqis in the same way, across the border, breathe a great sigh of relief. Nobody has hated Daesh more than Syrians and Iraqis. But Daesh is not defeated. And in Europe, where I live and where I come from, I can tell you, we're holding our breath for the next round. Fourth, the level of proxy involvement in Syria uh, has been on a steady upward curve since 2012, where we saw very little of it. It continues to grow. None of us imagined back then, in 2012, when I spent most of the year in Syria and working on Syria, that Syria would be so dominated, the Syrian conflict, Syrian future would be so dominated by the interests of others and by the actions of their militia and of those they pay to fight. However, there was always one good thing, and there was an, it was an unusual aspect much commented on of the Syrian conflict, that Israel has been thus far fairly silent. But I fear that's about to end. So Syria is a place, and we'll see later in the general remarks, of extraordinary proxy uh, concern. Fifth, some believe that there are winners already in Syria. They would be wise, in my view, to avoid triumphalism. I think, for example, Iran's long-term goal to establish a corridor from Tehran to Tartus, as it's known, uh, appears likely to succeed at present. But I'm one of those who doesn't see that as a contribution peace and stability in the region, and I don't think it's too late for others to interfere with this outcome. When we look at whether people are winners or losers, in 2012, we all thought that the regime was out, down, but not quite out, but soon would be out. Uh, we, we had leaders in Europe uh, making comments about the next government and the legitimacy of the current government and so forth, they were, we were largely wrong. And I think we, we are st we're going through an, a similar phase where we're tending to be precipitate in our assessments. Sixth, the United States has displayed great leadership in the war against Daesh. And I think we all owe them uh, a considerable gratitude. Uh, that demonstration of U.S. leadership is something that we would like to see more of in other aspects of Syria's immediate future. More, not less. Seventh, Europe uh, may appear to have played a secondary role so far with respect to the Syrian conflict. I think it would be wrong to count us out. Uh, Europe is a complex beast, it, is, uh, it has strengths that it finds sometimes difficult to leverage. But Europe's contribution is, I am sure, essential for a stable Syria. And I am sure that we can play, Europe can play, a much bigger role in the next phase of Syria's future. So to sum up, the conflict of the current situation in Syria, the conflict is not over, but it's in a very different place now than it was six, nine months ago. Do you remember last Christmas when we were reflecting, watching the agony of Aleppo, and we thought that, the, that after Aleppo there would be a complete turning point in the conflict, and we didn't know where it would go. Well, it didn't go to Idlib, it went to Raqqa. We, we find it very easy, to, I think, to miss the new signs of where the conflict in Syria will go. So let's be careful. Um, it's in a different place. We need new thinking and new energy if we're to rescue from the ruins of Syria a nation that is at peace. So what next? Thinking now ahead, what, we, what might be the priorities? The Syrian opposition, as you know, will be here in Riyadh this week. I would suggest they're in dire need of a strategy which is adapted to current events and possibilities, which is practical, feasible, and right. 
This should not be a strategy of surrender, but one which, with the right support, actually has a chance of success. And its aims and its objectives need to be adapted to that reality. I'd like to suggest some elements, maybe not overriding, but some important elements for such a strategy. The war may not be over. The revolution has not succeeded. Syrians require of us, I believe all of us, that we, can do, we should do all we can to rescue them from the wreckage of this conflict, some basis of a decent life. It's different objectives from those we have faced in the past. And I want to provide three practical examples of what I mean. First of all, we, we can help promote good governance in opposition areas. We mustn't give up on Idlib. Um, we must put pressure on all those concerned, whether it's Turkey, Russia, or indeed the HDS, the, former, the, the front that incorporates former Nusra, to influence them in this regard, in the way they administer territory and treat civil society and respond to humanitarian organizations. And then in the east and the north and east of Syria, we, we have the opportunity, a growing opportunity, to bring Arabs and Kurds together to agree on how they can govern themselves in the absence of a central state. There is an, a massive opportunity to do good for Syrians in that zone. A second example. Every effort needs to be made to reform the security sector in Syria. This, I th believe, and I'm not alone, of course, in this, is what brought the people out onto the streets in 2011. The way in which the security state in Syria reached into the lives of most families, and certainly most families since, with arbitrary detention and arrest, uh, surveillance and monitoring of activity. Uh, I, th I think it's right, we'll have experts in the room that are up to 18 um, security agencies in Syria. I think the opposition needs to make this a priority for negotiation, as it has not been. I'm not saying that would be easy, that that would be difficult, but it's a priority if people are to resume lives uh, back in Syria after this conflict has moved on. And that leads me to the third. Many Syrians want to go home. We mustn't stop this. We must let them make that decision, but we must do all we can to make their return safe. This means looking at issues of great importance, but of great detail. Will they be conscripted if they return to their homes in government-held areas? Will they be detained if they worked for NGOs, humanitarian NGOs? Will they be arrested for having worked with the opposition? Are their homes still available in their own names? What's happening to property rights in Syria? I was hearing on the way here yesterday from somebody working on this in Syria of the way in which what we may find is the view from Damascus that, yes, people may certainly return, but there may be it's not to where they left. It'll be to somewhere else. There'll be the potential for demographic um, change. So I, I'm, I passionately believe I, that this is, this is a really difficult issue. To try to uh, come to agreements with the authorities in Damascus, and actually the authorities in the, in the uh, so-called liberated areas, that people may return safely with legal protection is an enormously difficult issue. It's not simply one of negotiation. It's one of legal entitlement. It's one of international norms. But it's not just that. I also believe, and this is a controversial issue in, uh, with many, uh, in, in Europe, for example, that they, they have a right to return to schools and clinics available for their children, and that we should support those schools and those clinics wherever they return. So those are three quite practical examples which I think constitute, uh, which signal uh, an important shift in uh, priorities for attention to the issues of Syria's plight. It doesn't mean to say that the Geneva process and the Geneva communique and the hopes for an overall democratic state in Syria are utterly dashed, but it presents a new priority 
for this time. There's a lot to do in Syria and for Syrians. And as I shall see in my general remarks, it will depend on our action. I'd now like to turn to Yemen. Yemen's war uh, is so different from the one in Syria. But some of us wonder and fear if it's not just a war at an earlier stage, which is a remarkably depressing thought. In Syria, finding a solution was just about possible to imagine in 2012, those innocent days of the first years of this conflict in Syria. It has become much more difficult in Syria ever since. And in Yemen, as we shall see, I'm convinced a solution can be found to the conflict of Yemen. Uh, but I fear that opportunities may diminish over time. Let me offer you again in Yemen now some reflections on the current, uh, the current situation. Bearing in mind that I was lucky enough uh, recently to briefly visit Sana'a uh, to engage with the parties based there. Firstly, Yemen's exceptional tragedy, as we well know here, is its humanitarian dimension. Yemen's humanitarian issue is worse than Syria, depending on how you count it. It's worse than Iraq. It's probably worse than southern Sudan. It's probably worse, potentially worse than anywhere in the world. Most humanitarian crises are man-made. This is certainly one. The expulsion of the uh, legitimate government of Yemen was not a casual act. It was a de deliberate one. This one is therefore no exception. But just as it is man-made, so this one can be remedied by our actions. So the first uh, reminder on Yemen, of course, is its tragedy, as felt by its people. Secondly, while Yemen is certainly, and you know it well here, already a conflict with proxy interest, you know it very well here from the tragic recent uh, missile attack, it has not yet reached the level we see in Syria. And if we want to resolve the differences of the parties in Yemen, if it will depend on limiting the impact of the proxy interests, and I'll come to who they are later, no, no surprises, and focus our efforts on resolving Yemeni differences. Yemen's conflict can be resolved by Yemenis. As I said, I've thirdly recently returned from Sana'a. Uh, it was a brief visit. It's very difficult to get in and out, as you know. Um, but I was very grateful for the permission of authorities here, and in particular of the uh, government of uh, President Hadi. But I, one, of the, one of the things that I came away with, as somebody who's dealt with a lot of conflicts in many different parts of the world, and a lot of armed groups in different parts of the world, the Taliban, Kurds, Darfuris, and so forth, I'm convinced that the continuing isolation of the Sana'a parties, I'm referring obviously to the Houthi movement and the GPC, is an impediment to peace. I understand their isolation, but I don't think it's helping. And if we have learned anything in the art of mediation, it is that isolation breeds intransigence. And you have seen this very clearly, as do I. Fourth on Yemen, the war economy in Yemen is a major spoiler. Too many people are making a lot of money out of this war and perfectly happy for it to continue. We saw a lot of that in Sana'a, of course. Um, it's very difficult. Uh, in fact, the, the, I think one of the most difficult questions that people ask people like me on Yemen is, what makes you think anybody wants it resolved when you talk to people in Yemen, apart from those who are suffering daily? We need to find creative ways even in the middle of an emergency of great catastrophic proportions, in the middle of a war, to encourage business and penalize corrupt practices. This is not, uh, this is not contingent, this is core business. Fifth, and I say, as I said before, this is the good news, I think Yemen's war can be resolved. Let me suggest presumptuously some ways that we might move towards that. I think the coalition can, and I'm sure it will actually, show its concern for the welfare of the Yemeni people by improving access. 
Ideally, this will be in the, the a staged opening of the airport and also Hodeida. I'm sure we will get there. I think already we're seeing significant moves, as reported here today, to move back to that situation. An opening an, uh, which firmly uh, keeps in place a regime of inspection. That'll be a very good news. However, I think these measures, when they come, ideally should be orchestrated with the Sana parties to encourage a response from them. And one of the things in the mediation of conflicts is that no act goes unpunished, no good act goes unpunished. No concession should be given without a response, ideally, so that you create a dynamic which builds confidence and leads you away from war. And this is particularly true today. Ideally, the reopening of those airports and ports and um, the lifeline to the people of Yemen would be more than a humanitarian turning point itself, in, in and of itself, quite uh, vital and sufficient, but ideally a turning point in the war. This is, this is a, very, very, a very important point, a psychological turning point to suggest to the people of Yemen that the war is not infinite and endless. They need to believe in the possibility of peace, as do the leaders of the different parties. Peace comes through confidence in the parties that its advantages are real. So the first important point is a signal that this war need not go on indefinitely. Secondly, I believe, we should not rush back to talks. We should not rush back to Kuwait or wherever the talks are to be held. It has been a full year since the last talks were held. It's a long time. The parties, particularly the ones in Sana, but maybe others, are not yet, in my view, prepared for negotiation. Remarkably, they are ready for negotiation, but that's not the same as being prepared. Um, as in all peace negotiations, an act which fails, a peace negotiation which fails, is often uh, destructive, it takes you backwards rather than forwards. It's very important to prepare the ground properly uh, so that there, are, there is a basis for successful eventual negotiations. I'd like to suggest three elements which might uh, be worked on as a basis for successful negotiations in due course. First of all, no ceasefire, which of course is the first uh, essential agreement in any, in any negotiation. No ceasefire, whether it's uh, national or partial, will work without local support. It needs the leverage of the local communities in those areas who will report breaches. They need to be part of the system of monitoring a ceasefire. Syria, incidentally, has a lot of experience of this, and Saudi Arabia has a lot of experience in Syria of being part of those processes. Um, but this needs to be organized in advance. It requires detailed planning. You need to know where you're going to begin doing this work. It doesn't happen round the table at a cost of negotiating party. It needs substantial, technical, important work if, it's to work if the eventual agreement is to work. And in Yemen, it needs the involvement of the tribes. It's a very complex process. Secondly, uh, it's not just the south of Yemen, people tell me, that's restive. As you know, uh, the south has a, a long history of, not, of, of being a separate country, and now it's part of Yemen, and there's always been a fear, certainly recently in the context of this conflict, that uh, desire for secession, desires for secession in the south have risen, and, and we, we have had in my institute a lot of experience of listening to people who say that. Uh, so it's not just the South that's restive, that needs to be listened to, that needs to be part of any solution, that needs to be part of discussions about future politics. In fact, it's different parts of Yemen. As somebody that, that, that is not, it's, the different parts of Yemen are also restive. It's not just the South and the North is just a matter of negotiation between parties. Governance in Yemen is fragile and varied. And as I have been told by a number of very um, distinguished experts, there's a whole process that is necessary to look at how governance in Yemen can, can, can be so fashioned that it links up effectively with national politics in any future settlement. Somebody said, somebody, there's a nice phrase I, I heard recently, as they put it, that the South is everywhere in Yemen. 
building back those connections, identifying governance issues, making sure that the people involved in, in regions and sub-regions are listened to in governorates and promises, provinces have a say in the future of Yemen again without going through another four-year national dialogue, that's a piece of work that needs to be done. Finally, building a new politics in Yemen, new political arrangements, of course, is not the same as stopping the war. Stopping the war is the first step, essential, difficult, complicated. Building a new Yemen, even more so. It's, it's, it's complex and interestingly and not unusually and in all these conflicts, it, it includes different people. It's not just the people with the guns who need to be around the table to discuss peace. It's, politi it's, it's different political movements, civil society, interest groups, and so forth. So building new politics re needs work, and it, we need to know who's going to be involved in that and how long it will take. So I suppose my central point, before moving on to Iraq, is that a formal negotiation is the end of a process, not the beginning. But there's an urgent need to restart the journey towards it. Iraq, and then I move on to my general points. Iraq gives us hope. Much more brief on Iraq. It seems extraordinary to say this about Iraq, given recent history but I am convinced that it's so. Iraq, for a variety of reasons, is seeing a renaissance of nationalism and civic ambition. Political leadership in Iraq has helped bring us here. The awful consequences of a rupture, perhaps, with the Kurds were a wake-up call for Arab politicians in Iraq. And one possible uh, consequence was that uh, the Arab inclusion and Sunni inclusion, in particular, in national politics, became more likely. And this is a fundamental requirement for stability. Problems remain. For example, no country could be safe if militias are allowed to run free. In Iraq, this is especially true. We must be grateful for the role they played in the defeat of Daesh, but now they must go home. Building a new politics in Iraq means uh, encouraging coalitions and non-sectarian parties. It's possible. It's doable. And the, the good news is, of course, that you are already involved in doing that. The way in which the Saudi government reached out to hand to uh, leaders in Baghdad uh, to talk about the future of Iraq was enormously positive and a good priority. Now, my general points. Um, if time was stopped now, it would be impossible, I think, to avoid the conclusion that Iran is the overall winner as a result of the conflicts in the region. Their objective to establish that corridor I mentioned between Tehran and Tartus is close to realization. Iran has played a long game. It deliberates on the ways and means to export its Islamic re revolution, and it is well-placed with well-developed assets to do this. One very obvious example is Iran's capacity to mobilize, deploy, and support militias to advance its aims by military means. Hezbollah's effectiveness has, in this sense, been a model, and you know this very well as part of your discussion here about Yemen. No other state, in my view, possibly one, but no other state has the same capacity nor the same tactical skill in making this particular asset work. And Syria and Iraq both provide the clearest evidence of this. Iran's revolutionary aims are inevitably destabilizing in a region which is still grappling with the difficulties inherent in modernization. Resisting, Iran's, resisting Iran requires the same kind of strategic patience that Iran itself displays in its own strategies. And this patience should, in my view, include a strategic focus on the core geography in this rivalry, this meta-conflict in the region between Iran and Arab states. And this core geography I suggest, is Syria, Iraq, and in a different sense, Lebanon. Crucially, I argue, Yemen is not on this list. However, time actually never stops. In the recent moves we have seen here in Riyadh to combine modernizing forces with greater diplomatic activism are, of course, in line with the fact that there is something to be done in this region. As of now, we've yet to see with complete clarity the strategy that will take your policy forward. But uh, what, I, what we hope is that it will be a long game and that you will have the patience and the endurance to see it through. 
I have tried to identify specific steps that can be taken in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. I'd like to finish by putting these steps into the kind of regional context I've just been describing. I believe that Yemen is the outlier in the core rivalry between Iran and our hosts here. Others may disagree. I'm sure there will be disagreements. But Iran's expenditure of effort in Yemen is not comparable with its expenditures in Syria and Iraq, or in a different way in, in Lebanon. Yemen's conflict is frightening and dangerous. There's no doubt about it. And it's damaging to its people. But it's Yemenis who will resolve it. Uh, and it is focusing on them and empowering them that should be the core of our policy. We must be grateful for that small mercy. Iraq is an opportunity for Arab unity after years of internal dissension in that country. Saudi Arabia understands this very well and has been a creative front runner in holding out the hand to Baghdad. This must remain a priority in its overall strategy. Syria is unfinished business. Make no mistake about it, the dream of a modern Syria remains the dream of many Syrians. The vicissitudes of war have thrown Arabs and Kurds together. It's possible in so-called liberated areas to imagine and build and support modern, democratic, robust institutions. Saudi assistance for this will be enormously welcome and enormously important, and it is indeed assistance for peace after years of war. Dr. Saud, Yahya, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity, uh, for this presentation. I hope, I hope uh, that what it shows overall is that there is a necessary relationship between diplomacy and my business, which is mediation and conflict resolution. We need each other. We need to understand each other's needs. And thank you very much for the opportunity to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Griffiths, for uh, this uh, great uh, presentation. And uh, I believe uh, there will be a lot of questions and comments uh, talking about conflict, it's always uh, hard, I believe, especially where there is a multiple dimension, the internal and regional dimension, and also the uh, international dimension. Also talking about strategies uh, when precising who do what, I believe uh, in the, uh, uh, where there is a multiplier of actors, uh, building confidence process will take time. Yeah. Uh, but that was very full of hope, so I thank you for that. Now we will open the floor for uh, uh, the comments and questions. Ladies and gentlemen, لو سمحت تعرف بنفسك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم and introduce yourself please هيثم الأشقر a reporter or a journalist from Syria what I heard from the speaker what I heard from the speaker that the uh, that the revolution in Syria has failed. And I would like to tell him that in, in, in Syria there was no revolution. What happened in Syria what happened in Syria, I will repeat the question for you. Okay. Uh, there was no revolution in Syria. What happened? There was, there was a, a popular congestion or popular discontent that came out of the corruption, the corrupt regime in Syria. That corruption created uh, uh, dissatisfaction and disenfranchisement. And the opposition was not able to lead the, uh, the, the people. Uh, and let me uh, say that the elite were not able to lead the people. 
the Syrian and the Iranian intelligence agencies and the intelligence of Hezbollah led the population of the people to a revolution. And we, we discovered a lot of people who were leading the demonstrations from the, from the Syrian and the Hezbollah and Iranian elements. Uh, it was an uprising. It was an uprising. And it was armed by the Syrian intelligence uh, to, to carry out uh, an Iranian uh, uh, objectives uh, despite of the Alawites. And the Alawites, the sect that, uh, to which Assad belong, are uh, uh, manipulated like the Sunnis. Uh, there was no revolution, and uh, the revolution hasn't failed, but in the first place there was no revolution in Syria. It was acted out by foreign agents. Assalamu alaikum. Salih Bittish. In, uh, in the titles includes two terms, fires and conflicts. Uh, if it's fires, then we need external support. If it's conflicts, we need internal or local support. So how do you see it in Iraq and Yemen? Is it fire or conflicts? The other points regarding the war economy. The war economy there is some uh, parties benefit from the war. All the fingers are pointing to Iran, but I'm sure there is stakeholder or shareholders benefiting from the war. What are those uh, stakeholders? Shukran. Thank you. Al-Mustafida min istimrar al-harb. Uh, I thank uh, King Faisal Center for hosting the speaker and I would like to thank our speaker for this uh, uh, informative uh, uh, speech, Dr. Abdurrahim Brahim al uh, a professor of history and, a sp and I have a book that was published about the sectarian, uh, uh, sectarian uh, elements in uh, Lebanon. I would say that the external influence is the bigger player in, in Syria uh, from the early times up to the present. And here we need to look to the external influence. Our speaker referred to Kofi Annan. Um, I think he has the expertise uh, uh, regarding the resignation of Kofi Annan. And Kofi Annan realized that the Syrian problem has entered into the big powers or the big powers game. And this is one. With regard to Daesh or ISIS, which has been and the global coalition against Daesh and what happened in the mountains of and there were 20 bosses and coaches under the American monitoring this indicates that Daesh is a game that has been created by external uh, players to make them a pretext to enter Syria and I would say that the UN had contributed directly to, uh, to uh, take the Syrian uh, problem to uh, hand it over to, uh, uh, to Russia and America is now killing us by the Russian by the Russians and I was in Moscow when the Russian forces came in, 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 in 2015 the Russian reality, uh, uh, it has a collapsed economy and it cannot move armies to go to a city in Syria, uh, in Moscow. 
And I would say, our speaker hasn't uh, have not spoken about the internal influence, which is the authoritarian regime. And all the revolutions happened in authoritarian regimes. Uh, and there was uh, a writer uh, who wrote a book about the uh, authoritarian regime in Syria. If the Syrian regime with all its uh, militias, uh, a revolution is going to take place. Thank you. You want to comment on that, please? Um, first of all, I, thank you. There are many things I, I, I uh, didn't touch on in terms of an, an analyzing and assessing these three conflicts. Time would not permit, and what I was trying to do was to focus on where we go from here rather than how it was there. But for, I'd make a few points perhaps in answer. One is um, the internal-external issue was very important, it's crudely speaking, is diplomacy or mediation. And if you don't have uh, a successful partnership between these two, in this region in particular, uh, you, it's, it's very, very difficult to resolve a conflict. Famously, and I refer partly here to Kofi Annan, but also Lakhda Brahimi made the same uh, reference. Uh, Kofi Annan, uh, when he left being the envoy, as you mentioned, when he resigned in the end of August 2012, said he had lost the support of the P5 in the Security Council. He started in March 2012 with their support, and when he lost it in the uh, Council's decisions at the end of July, he quit. He referred to his colleagues. He told us about the famous three circles of uh, importance. Uh, the outer circle being the international powers, particularly re exampled by the Security Council. The second circle being the circle of regional countries. And the inner circle being the circle of Syrian parties. And you could make the same assessment and analogy in most conflicts, particularly in this region. Anand's point was that without coherence between the three circles, you don't get a chance to resolve the conflict. So it's not an either-or. It's seeking the leverage of one to influence the other. When Lahta Brahimi left, his, and I was working for him at the time, in the spring of 2014, he famously said, it's the time for the region to step forward. And, uh, and my goodness, the region has stepped forward, by the way, ever since. What I think until Demistura, and I'm you know, going to make a, judge, make a judgment here, because I'm not in the United Nations. Uh, well, until to Mistura, neither Anan nor Brahimi, in fact, paid much attention to the inner circle, to the Syrian parties. There was not much mediation done, if mediation is a description of trying to resolve differences between conflicting parties. And if you don't get involved in mediation, you tend not to succeed. I remember attending a meeting uh, with uh, President Assad in July of 2012, when Secretary General, former Secretary General Annan had come to uh, Damascus to brief uh, Bashar al-Assad on the Geneva agreements of the 30th of June, a couple of weeks before. You remember the famous Geneva communique transition. And I remember vividly the meeting in which Annan, who I, who I admire enormously, said, so I'm here, Mr. President, to brief you about this transition that has been agreed in Geneva. And Assad said, I don't understand, Mr. Anand. Transition to what? From where? Did I, I, no, I'm not sure anybody's asked me about this issue so far. And it was obviously you know, designed to just challenge the primacy of the particular circle that Anand had focused on, which was the outer one. And, if, uh, and, and the, the, the absent serious work with the parties, and this is, of course, my point about Yemen, uh, that there has not been, for very many reasons, serious work with the parties, uh, it's been very difficult to do that, you don't really have a chance of resolving the conflict. So I think you need a coherence of all, particularly in this region, where there is such an interest in the affairs of states. That's my one point. Um, 
it wasn't a revolution. You're probably right. I am not a scholar on Syria. Uh, it certainly was not a very comfortable time. I think the Syrian people got up and they went, as they put, one of them put it to me, they went to the squares to demonstrate that they'd had enough of this uh, regime and they wanted different. And most of them still do. They probably won't get it. Uh, but maybe they will get some part of what they wanted. I remember vividly a 70-year-old man. This was in Homs in 2012, June, when Homs was the focus of the war. He said to me, he said, I, I uh, have two things I want to tell you. I was in the United Nations. He said, I want to not to die before I have one opportunity to vote in a free Syria. That's all. Whatever comes out of it. The other thing I want is give, as he's put it very lyrically, he said, give us back our squares. Give us back our opportunity to come out and speak publicly about the things concern us. I don't know if that's a revolution or if it was co-opted by other forces, but there's no doubt the sincerity of people, particularly the nonviolent protesters of 2012, 2011, who wanted a change in their country. On the war profiteering, the war economies and the profiteering, I have a general point here, which I think is true throughout the efforts to resolve conflicts, of which not just in this region, uh, that the spoiler effect of war profiteering or people who make profits from war, is still for mediators, for, for envoys whose job it is to orchestrate the diplomacy and mediation, is still a sort of secondary matter. We, 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 I included myself in that, don't do enough work to understand the spoiler effect of people making money out of war. There's a famous uh, example in Yemen recently by, I think, a British researcher who's, who's given the, the very vivid example that in Yemen, in Sana'a, the Baskin and Robbins has never shut. So the franchise of Baskin and Robbins in Sana'a has opened every day, and it's had its materials trucked in from wherever, and in a, in a, in a situation where cholera is rife and medicines can't get through, you can always get Baskin and Robbins. In fact, when I was there, there it was, bright lights of Baskin and Robbins. Well, it's there as a sort of, as an, a symbol of somebody making a buck on ice cream. And, you know, that's not a, probably a very big issue, but, but the, 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 the idea that people benefit out of war is hardly new. This goes back through history, as people in this room know. In Yemen, it's, 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 it's clearly an issue. Um, it's not just Iran which is benefiting. A lot of people are benefiting out of the war economy in, in Yemen. Um, and partly they are doing so in order to keep the economy going, because it's not a peace economy, it's not a legal economy. So there are problems, uh, but we need, to, uh, we need to identify what it is that makes war economies work. Just one final example on that. Um, when I was um, talking, I remember to the Russian ambassador in, uh, in Damascus in 2014, and we were talking about oil sales. And as you know, there were oil sales being made from ISIS to the regime, oil from the areas that Daesh was controlling up near Deir ez and eventually over to Raqqa, and they were selling oil to, to the state. And of course, they were selling oil to parts of the opposition as well. And they continued to do so for the next couple of years. And I remember the Russian ambassador was a very, very good diplomat. He said, it's cheap oil. You know, where are we going to get oil? We always have bought it from there. It's still oil that we need. What should we do? Now, you know, fair, a fair point. The result was that somebody got rich. Right, there is a question uh, by Dr. Mohammed bin Eid al-Atabi. He said, what's the relation between uh, the conditions that was presented by the foreign minister, uh, for, uh, Syrian foreign minister and what's happening now in Syria? And his second question... Uh, what, could you say what, was the, what uh, did the foreign minister say? Uh, the conditions, in fact. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if you could elaborate a little bit. Uh, 
I got only just the last sentence. What was it? Well, it was about the uh, law that related to Syria that was presented by Colin Powell. Uh, also, he's mentioned about the uh, Syrian opposition, why it's always uh, considered as uh, supported or supported by another country, foreign country. Yeah. Uh, good evening. Uh, a reporter from Riyadh newspaper. Thank first, I would like to greet the speaker. I have a question. Since the title of this, uh, uh, how to put out fires uh, and the armed conflict in Iraq and Syria and Yemen, as we know that the European countries has condemned the Iranian intervention in this region and they condemned the Iranian claims, don't you consider the European investment in Iran in oil and gas such as the Total Company uh, in Iran, is it in favor of Iran? If these investments continue, uh, the conflict will not end and there would be no solution to put out these conflicts. And I think also if this economic support that is provided to Iran, uh, the war would not end and, and these fires would not be uh, uh, put out. Uh, uh, is the Iranian economy uh, is going to be undermined or are you going to ease sanctions on Iran to prevent it from continuing its uh, aggression or interference? Safathani. Good evening, Mr. Griffith. My name is Dalian. I'm a political analyst. My question to you, you uh, spoke so eloquently on the corridor between Tehran and Tartus, mm. and my question is the flip side of what the lady just, uh, the lady from the, uh, the press just asked you, mm. which is about Saudi Arabia's policy towards Iran. If you look at the problem holistically, you see Iran is a multi-tentacled nation. A multi? Tentacled mm. nation, that but, is, mm. it's in several countries. At the beginning of the problem in 2011, we all saw how Iran was dabbling in Bahrain and and Saudi Arabia was forced at the time to intervene by mm. introducing the, uh, the Arabian, uh, G the GCC Peninsula Shield and quickly uh, quash that. If Saudi Arabia is really going to look to the north and the problem there, well, what is it supposed to do about Yemen? Just leave its back exposed to Iran? Because if there's a focus towards the north, then the south is mm. going to be, it's not just a, a, a corridor, it seems, it is a crescent. And I know that people talk about this issue in this region a great deal. Following the, uh, the agreement that was the result of the P5 plus one talks, Iran used revenues from its oil sales because of the agreement, uh, not to fix its economy, which was initially the purported intention, but to engage in more nefarious activities. So what exactly is Saudi Arabia supposed to do about all this? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Griff, for this informative speech. You, you, you ruled out talking about Libya uh, in this uh, speech. Why have you, haven't you talked about uh, Libya? The fire uh, in Libya uh, is uh, going beyond Libya, even to Europe. Uh, the slogan was uh, the people wanted to topple the regime and uh, in Egypt also the people wanted to topple the regime but in Syria and in Yemen the people want to topple the regime. Uh, at the beginning, the slogan was peaceful, and then they said, go and leave Bashar. 
Uh, this was a popular movement. In Syria, the power was very cunning. Uh, there were organizations and they wanted to uh, partition or to divide the spoils among them. And the regime has entered with organizations and they managed the conflict in a special way. There were organizations and there were militias. Uh, they were working for themselves. The conflict turned into religious sectarianism. It was supported by uh, Hezbollah uh, from the Leb Lebanese government and from the Iraqi government or the Shia government. In Iraq, there was no popular movement that wanted to change the regime. But there was a big regime that wanted to topple the regime for their own interest. To use the chemical weapons and what uh, uh, Iraq was uh, colonized and invaded. But other things uh, uh, remained uh, as they were. Uh, I hope uh, to to be uh, I hope to be um, hopeful or to share your hope about the future. Uh, good evening. My name is Faisal Abul Hassan from the King Faisal Center. Excuse me. Uh, you mentioned uh, earlier that. Um, when you're talking about the resettlement of people back in Syria, it might not necessarily be in the same places that they left. Um, and I was just wondering if a, a planned resettlement with the aim of forced integration of these ethnic and religious communities in Syria might actually be a positive in the region. That's basically my question. Could you just repeat that? Yeah, yeah so you, you were mentioning that when people want to go back might, home, might, okay, yeah. that part, mm. but might not some sort of planned forced reintegration and resettlement policy uh, okay. lead to more mixed communities to avoid armed conflict in the future. Yeah. I don't know who would plan said resettlement, but okay. that's not the question. Okay, we'll take a quick answer, then yeah. we will take maybe the last round. Okay, thank you. Um, 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 no, we shouldn't leave Yemen alone. I mean, it's, 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 it's not a matter of like, what I, I, I wasn't arguing that Yemen was not important. In fact, I think it's very important. I don't think Yemen is going to be resolved uh, absent favorable diplomacy and regional interests. It's not, it's not, uh, it shouldn't be an orphan. But it's not the same level, I, I suggest. I, I knew there would be disagreement, obviously, in, in this, uh, of, of strategic importance as we find up in the north. But, you know, having an unstable Yemen, of course, is an existential issue for Yemenis first and then for Saudis. And it's essential that it's resolved. My, my, my line is, I think it can be. Um, it needs a lot of work to make it happen. But it would be nice to have a, a, a conflict in this region which is actually finally resolved for the benefit of the people. Uh, and I think that's possible. And I think your policy from here will be enormously important in obviously achieving that. I am not going to um, enter into uh, uh, representing Europe and its relations with the Iranian economy, because I think that's thank goodness, beyond the remit of my um, discussion here. Um, I, I would say that uh, I did dodge Libya. Um, and, and, and the reason I, I dodged talking about Libya was because we're not working there. Libya, Libya. I, I dodged Libya, talking about Libya because uh, we don't, I don't, I, I, what, the remarks I made here tonight are all, all on the basis of working in these particular conflicts. Having said that, we have tried to work in Libya. Libya is an enormously important conflict for Europe, as you suggest. It's extremely difficult to see how it's going to be resolved. I give you know, great hope to Mr. Salome, the new United Nations envoy. I don't envy him. It's an enormously difficult task. I think it's on a level with Syria in terms of difficulty to resolve it. And for Europe, we, cert we haven't got our act together yet. It's very difficult to do so. Uh, in 28 member states, soon to be 27, to do so. But it's, 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 it's very, very hard indeed. And uh, I, was, I was talking to a class of, of students recently about what do they think are the, the serious strategic future threats if we look 20 years on in conflict globally. And of course, the two that they 
identified were migration and, com and climate change. These are the two major uh, conflict drivers which we are not, not, we don't have the instruments to deal with. Um, I think Syria, I think, I, I, I raced through Iraq because I think I was overdoing my time, but actually uh, Iraq, I think, is an exciting place to be these days. I'm hoping that the election in the spring, if, if there is one, will, will, will produce a new generation, the post-Saddam generation, beginning to come through in political life, and they, I hope, will rescue us. It's, it's remarkable to think of Iraq as a place which will lead us up to the, the uplands, but I think it can. And I have been quite struck by the work that we're doing in Iraq on promoting Sunni inclusion in the national polit political project, that there is a growing interest and appetite from the Shia political leaders in Iraq for that inclusion to happen, partly because I think of the Kurdish uh, con concern. And it's also interesting, I think, the Kurdish, the overreach that we saw uh, by, the, by the leadership of Barzani in Kurdistan has actually led to the possibility of a settlement which, would, which we must hope will be a generous settlement with the Kurds and not a punitive one after what happened there. So I think Iraq, you know, is a good, is a, is a, is a good story which is, which is more than welcome. And it's a story about inclusion and plur pluralism. And what we need to see in Syria, um, as my colleague here, who is with me um, from Brussels, Mr. Al Abde, was telling me earlier in Syria is a pluralist society, not one dominated, dis described as Alawite or Sunni, outs or ins. Um, I think you're right. I think Syria did become a sectarian conflict. I think it was also very interesting. I think this is part of the question that was raised by uh, the gentleman about. Also, were all Syrian opposition movements funded by somebody else, or were they all created uh, by other sponsors? There has not been, I think, in history, I th well, I'm risking myself a bit here among scholars, but a, a conflict where there has been such disparate, so three features of Syrian opposition. One, more Syrian opposition movements, there were 5,000 armed groups at one point, than any, any other conflict we've ever heard of all doing merger and acquisition work with each other, taking one over and, and so forth, in the middle of a conflict, spending a lot of time dealing with each other to see how they would prosecute the war and thus reducing their impact. Secondly, um, and this will be a very interesting week in Riyadh, leadership, leadership which is leadership, which is about not merely um, parroting the views of the people but also leading them towards a feasible objective. We haven't seen national leadership come through in the Syrian conflict from the opposition. I think uh, we've seen one or two, but they were instantly slapped down uh, by others. So that's really important for the success of any opposition. And I, and I think the third is this sponsorship thing. You know, people used to say, sorry to say this in this, in this uh, city, but that the Syrian opposition coalition, you remember, based in, in Istanbul, was always um, a tumble of competing interests, whether Qatar was sponsoring or Riyadh was sponsoring or somebody else was or somebody else. And this, this has been enormously difficult for, as it were, genuine, authentic Syrian activists to cope with. It's, also, it's necessary because there needs to be funding of, of, of the, the fight, if you like. Um, but it's, 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 not, it's, it's not a picture that we would like to it's not a picture that is, is part of an effective opposition movement. I think there's quite a lot of interesting scholarly work to be done on that. The forced reintegration, just one last comment. I hate to think of, of, of the idea that um, making people move somewhere else is going to help um, build social, social ties. But I know the burden of your question, I think, is absolutely right, which is, while Syria's conflict is not over, we're beginning to see the outlines of the real damage that this conflict has done, which is intercommunal damage. And the way in which people are going to have to live together who have been slaughtering each other, who have taken the property rights of one house and given it to another family, this is generational work, for which, by the way, <coughs> international diplomacy and attention will be limited, and money even more so. This is why... I think smart, uh, including smart European uh, money, reconstruction is not just physical. 
Reconstruction is also social. And the efforts that we need to make to get people to live together are going to be vital. And I'll give an example. And I tried to do this, and we tried to do this in Homs in 2012. Make sure that primary schools are not just in managed, the primary school boards or the committees which run a school are not just sectarian. So they are ob ob obliged to be overseen by communities which are not just from one area. Make sure that clinics are not just in the Sunni area, that they serve both and that their boards do that. There's lots of, not tricks, but there are ways in which we can help Syrians live together because they need to. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman, Sayyid Fal Muntasaf. Hi, Mr. Martin. My name is Faisal Huel, a political analyst from Washington, D.C. I uh, would like just to ask three questions. They would be like, pretty quick uh, for each country of them. First, uh, for Iraq, I met last year with John Nixon, who was a CIA officer, the first one who met with Saddam Hussein during the investigation. And Saddam Hussein was telling him that uh, you wouldn't understand our country because it's so complicated, uh, different like uh, parts and uh, different sections. So my question for Iraq, how to make sure uh, that not, like, not, not one part of them control the other? <coughs> that that's not like one part control like oh, other yeah. parts. Yeah, uh, you can see like the uh, PMF, which is the yeah. Popular Mobilization Forces. Yeah. yeah, now it's part of the Iraqi like official forces. Yeah. Uh, second question for Syria: um, Why you think um, what was I mean preventing the international uh, community from like uh, going on ground to Syria, just like watching them or like trying to find a negotiation? There is no like forces on ground. Uh, last question for Yemen. I think in Saudi Arabia we had like an experience during like a five, a five agreement uh, with Lebanon, where like Hezbollah was part of it. We asking them to become like a political party, and then they uh, going back to be like an armed militia. So uh, for Yemen, how to make sure like the Houthi is not doing the same thing again, like being an armed forces after like an agreement uh, to be a political party. Thank you. Uh, a reporter, my question, you mentioned that you, you, you went to Sana'a and you met the Houthis. What the uh, militia leaders told you and do you think uh, have they have they told you that they have intention intention to solve the conflict or they wanted to kill the Yemeni people and do you think do you think that the uh, uh, the mentality of the militia understand dialogue understand dialogue and political resolution or they only understand the, uh, the language of arms and weapons he's asking in English لدي سؤالان السؤال الأول هل تعتقد أن الأزمة في اليمن والعراق وسوريا وأجبت جزئيا على هذا السؤال على المدى الطويل هل ستسبب عدم استقرار نفسي واجتماعي ونفسي وهل يصعب التعافي من ذلك على المدى القصير السؤال الثاني هل تعتقد أن الأزمة السورية والعراق كذلك هل هي أمثلة جيدة الفشل الدول الغربية أو الدبلوماسية الغربية أو التدخل الغربي في الشرق الأوسط هذا مثل جيد على أن الدول الغربية والولايات المتحدة وفشلها فشل سياساتها
تفضل سيد هنا والسيد الثاني الصف الثاني السلام عليكم محمد عامر محمد العامر ريبورتر فروم المواطن نيوزبيبر How do you see or view the Iranian future in the light of its interference in the crises in the Middle East and in the internal affairs to the point that they have launched more than 70 missiles, including the recent, the most recent one? I may there was a statement by the Crown Prince, uh, uh, Prince Mohammed, uh, uh, that Obama had uh, uh, had missed a lot of opportunities, and now the situation has become very complex. Since you have been working in the UN, if Obama has invested in this opportunity, how we could have seen Syria now? Uh, good evening. Th thank you for your uh, presentation, Abdurrahman Salman, political analyst. Uh, specifically on Yemen, uh, you outlined, uh, I think, three solutions that focused on the um, local aspect uh, of the equation, if you will, specifically in terms of you know uh, engaging the tribes, uh, focusing on governance. Uh, <coughs> governance. Uh, however, at the same time, I was thinking about the Kofi Annan. Uh, mm. map, so to mm. speak, uh, the regional and the, uh, and the international. So if you, if you may, you know, if you could specifically tackle the international in terms of the role of the yeah. big power, so to speak, yeah. Yeah. and the regional aspect of it, I think you alluded a couple of times to the Saudi policy. Mm. Perhaps if you could help us articulate that policy. Thank you. Mohammed <laughs> I wanted to ask you, uh, <coughs> what's your opinion on the probability that some regions or a certain region might secede in one of the three countries? Shukran. Yes, please go ahead. Do you know, there's a famous um, partner movie, an American movie, in which the character, there's a woman, I think, but there are, you know, I'll go with this one, who says at the end of the movie, when she's asked a question, she said, five seconds from a clean getaway. And I was thinking that when you asked the question about Saudi policy to Yemen. I was almost out of the door before, you know, you asked me this question. Thank you. Um, so I'll try and, I'll try and uh, uh, answer or avoid it in my answers. Um, a, n a number of things. Um, first of all, um, um, there are a number of questions. Iraq and sectarianism. Iraq... Iraq, and any other country, frankly, and in, I include mine, um, needs to build institutions, and I refer to it in a way in the context of local institutions and schools, that depend on non-sectarianism, that depend on communal support. In Iraq, Sunni, Shia, Sunni inclusion in national politics is a sine qua non for stability. I don't doubt that for a minute. Uh, the winner-takes-all uh, approach to Iraqi politics in which uh, elections have become the opportunity for, as I say, the winner takes all, um, have not brought Iraq stability or peace. They almost brought Iraq to pieces uh, with the recent referendum uh, by with the Kurdish uh, party uh, under Bazani. So it's essential that institutions support uh, p pluralism and require people to talk to others as opposed to simply themselves. And this is local, regional, and national. Um, importantly, you know, to, 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 to jumping between some of these questions, we can't have a peace in Yemen with active militia. We can't have a peace in Iraq with active militia who are outside state control. I'm firmly an old-fashioned school which believes that the state should have the monopoly of violence. Uh, if you allow a militia to continue, it isn't, it isn't peace. It's a settlement. It's a way station. It may be better than what's gone before, but it's not peace. 
and you do not allow people who are not in that militia, who don't uh, pr uh, promote their views through violence, to live a thorough national life. So in Yemen or anywhere else, uh, there has to be, in any settlement, a process whereby the state is recreated, institutions are recreated, and the state ultimately re recovers the monopoly of force. Um, in Yemen, Syria, or elsewhere. And by the way, while I'm on the subject of elsewhere, I quickly jump to the issue of secession, which I was asked about. We in Europe know quite a bit about this recently because of Spain. I come from a region of the United Kingdom, which Wales, which occasionally tries to secede, and we never quite made it so far. Um, so, but we, we've learned in Europe from our mistakes, and I think the, the Kurds in Iraq have learned from their mistakes on that. Secession is a rupture. It's a violent change of the structures and sinews of society. It is always difficult. It's like a divorce. It's always difficult. It's always painful. It needs the best of circumstances to allow it to happen in the best way. We like to think in my country that the way in which the Scottish issue of secession has been managed has been one which is reasonably generous and gentle and soft. But even there, it's a polarizing issue within Scotland. Um, I'm, I'm not one of those who thinks that secession is the solution to conflict. The solutions to conflict are the issues that people fight about. And uh, secession is an escape from conflict, which who would not want to do that in a case like Yemen? Who would not want to run away from the turbulence and misery that's coming through that conflict, pr principally in the north? But secession of the south is not going to help the people of Yemen is my view. However, it's their decision. It's not ours. It's not yours. Uh, it's certainly not Europe's. Uh, it is their decision, and they need to be allowed to make that decision in a proper way. Um, I think the issue, uh, uh, slightly dodging the question, but not entirely, on red lines and Obama and, and interference, I think, uh, I think uh, the US, I think we all learned a lesson through the way in which the red line on chemical weapons was dodged. You know, because in fact, as we know now, the chemical weapons weren't all taken out of uh, Syria, and we've seen their use since. If you have a red line, as we used to say before Obama fluffed it, uh, we used to think you should stick to it. What's important clearly in the nature, and this is a general answer to a lot of questions, and I hesitate to say it because I'm not from this region, but it's Essentially, imp essentially important. We understand, I think, what Iran has been trying to do. And they've been doing it very well, by the way. And they've been doing it very effectively. And we, many of us don't like it, but it's been done quite well. To, to, to resist that, to make this rivalry work and to go in a different direction, to be a dynamic which favors peace and pluralism and populism uh, and modernization, there needs also to be clarity about the red lines that you will impose and the efforts and the priorities that you will present. And, they, and the point I'm trying to make about don't do it everywhere is that you need to focus your efforts to do it where it's really necessary, but to be clear overall on the things that need to be done and that you will not allow not to be done. The, the, um, the issue of failure of Western diplomacy, I'm up for that. Um, no problem in agreeing failure of Western diplomacy. I th look, I'm, I'm one of those who, who's a, who's, who hasn't, see, hasn't been very uh, proud of the fact that a number of governments in Europe declared Assad to be a redundant and no longer legitimate, and I never understood why they should have the right to say that. I thought it was a Syrian uh, prerogative, not a prerogative of some, uh, including my government, in fact. Um, do the Houthis want dialogue? Well, some do and some don't. Uh, and it's probably true of all parties. Some do and some don't. Um, the Houthis I met, and I met a very good uh, wide, wide uh, array of Houthi leaders, were very impressive, I would say, in many ways. And I can tell you one thing that they, they said universally, and I asked the question very specifically, are you wanting a return to dialogue a year now that it has been since there was that dialogue, and they all said yes, which is better than saying no. I, I don't think they're ready for it, because I think they need to think through uh, their approach to it. But they all said yes. 
The issue, I think, is how to, how to move to a situation where what they have achieved, as they see it, is not lost, as they see it, uh, where there is the maximum, it won't be completely possible, but the maximum amount of win-win. I mean, peace is supposed to benefit all of us. It doesn't benefit all of us. Some prefer war and the benefits that war brings. But we must always, and this is my final point, mediators require a suspension of belief. If you believe in the value of peace and the likelihood of negotiation to get you there, you have to ignore a lot of rational argument against it, like war profiteering and so forth. And if that's the case, then we must look to the, to the best instincts of people in Yemen who are suffering and the best instincts of diplomats who want stability and predictable relations between states. Stability and predictable relations between states are a proximate cause of peace. Of that, there can be no doubt. And I hope that that's what we will see from here in the time to come. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Thank you indeed. Thank you, Mr. Griffiths. From Mr. Griffiths, هو بل نأمل في أن يتحقق السلام في المنطقة. We would like to thank the audience uh, on behalf of King Faisal Center, and I would like to thank the uh, uh, people who asked questions. And we apologize for those who weren't able to ask questions. And thank you very much. Thank you very much.